Good afternoon, you now. My name is Fernanda Parente, and I'm here to moderate our next panel, More Than Human Narratives. This panel is going to look like at how digital media is shifting access, expression, and agency uh, to affect artistic practice. And our speakers are coming with a post-humanistic perspective, and they will analyze new actors, the role of the human audience, and also of the human body. So before we get started, I would like to let you know how this panel is organized. So first of all, each one of the speakers will give an input talk for about 20 minutes. And later on, we will all gather together here on stage to have a discussion, which we hope that you will also join. And to get started, I would like to introduce you to our first speaker, Christian Zolna. Christian is a designer, activist, and professor of design methods and experiment at Burg Gibrichenstein Kunsthochschule in Halle. He regularly publishes especially texts on discourse in design and exhibitions, and he, oh, sorry, exhibits worldwide in places such as MoMA New York, Octloft in Shenzhen, and Fiesp Sesi in Sao Paulo in Brazil. Since 2012, Christian has been leading the design and research um, at the Constitute uh, together with Sebastian Piazza. The studio works with partners from science, art, education, and politics on projects in the field of experimental media art, design activism, social design, and design education. The Constitute worked on the new work point of view, which is being exhibited here at New Now, for about four years. And Christian is going to be telling us about it today. Christian, the stage is yours. Um, hello, uh, my, uh, yeah. my name is Christian. As Fernanda was saying, a uh, very welcome uh, to all of you here in Essen and to everybody in the in the internet, uh, it's, it's weird. Usually there's a computer here, um, so where I could just have my slides, but it's all surrounded here, so I try to give my best to go through. Um, as Fernanda said, we have a, a piece, an artwork here at the festival. It's the white helmets uh, that, with the camera eyes that everybody is walking around with. Um, with this talk, I would just try to take you a bit into the history of the project, a bit on the backgrounds, and a bit into the process of how we made it. So it, it has a bit of a, yeah, it's a, it's a little journey. You can just relax and let's go. Um, as it says, point of view, it's a, um, like a wording, word game playing with the, with the meanings of point of view, which means like um, viewpoint, viewport, and you as a position where you stand. And we want to, as we mm, twist with the words, we also wanted to twist with our sensual environments. But I take you a bit back. Uh, but I should not press back, I press next. So um, one thing that we know is that us as uh, humans, we have a binocular viewport. That means we have like two eyes regularly uh, positioned in the front of our heads next to each other so that we can look in one direction like this. And we have a, a field of view that goes like, uh, like this, for example. But animals, different animals, here we have a chart where it's visible to, or where you can see um, mammals, like not insects and not fish, but these. Um, yeah, it's a cat, it's a dog, and it's a, it's a rabbit. And you see they, due to, their, uh, to the position of the eyes in their head, they can see differently. So for example, as you see, a dog has a bit the blind spot uh, in front, but it, work, it works more like this. So, or not, it's not the blind spot, it's the best spot, but there are blind spots as well. So our idea was, in a, in a work that I will show you right now, how does it feel if we work like this? Because our spatial impression, how do we see the world, is very much 
centered around the idea that you have two eyes in front of your head. But what happens with, our, with the construction of space, like the inner construction of external space, when you change it, when you, when you change your eyes? How does your brain um, work with that? So um, here you also see like, the, like a little diagram of how the uh, view or range of view changes um, depending on what kind of animal you are. So, um, and there's also a thing that, um, that, that there is the idea of changing this uh, pers perspective and perception, but it comes from a very grim and cold and horror thing. So like, okay, the eyes are very special. They are like the, the center of the soul. And uh, I see in your eyes that also romanticized, but also very much dehumanizing a person if, you, if it has no... Uh, eyes in the face. So this guy, the pale guy or pale man in Pan's Labyrinth, has this, and it comes also with the idea of take the hands into your eyes, and that's what we what we what we tried to do um, with with our work Isect. And this um, this work is like from 2012, and it is a, and, and in this helmet there is um, there is a VR headset, and to this VR headset two cameras are attached. And um, as you know, VR headsets, they um, divide your, um, your field of view in the half. So you get, you get input, visual input for that side and for that side, and due to, the, to a shift in um, and like a bit black, uh, black box magic, you cr they create a three-dimensional um, image in your head. So we twisted that and we really said, okay, what we have in this camera goes to this eye and what I have in this camera goes to that eye. So if I, if I take both eyes like here, it's more or less the same as I, I look so. But if I do like this, I can see the world uh, like a horse or like a goose or if I move it independently like a chameleon. And there we already started to leave the human visual perspective or perception of world um, in, a, in, a, in a first experiment and um, been with this quite around and experiment with a lot of people for that. So here you see again the whole system. You have these two cameras. They go to into, into one computer interface that is included into the helmet and that is going to be streamed to that VR headset and then divided into the two view fields. So this is where we came from, but it was from 2012. We had the first Oculus Rift included that, um, that was available at Kickstarter through that time. So this wasn't, and it was a lot of work, so like the whole technological progress was faster than us. So after a while, we couldn't give this to people anymore because they were setting, uh, they're putting it off and saying, ah, what's about, um, it's super glitchy and wow, the resolution is not so good. And we was like, hey, fuck, it's like the first VR headset that we've put in here. So we changed a bit the things and went on to, um, to, to, to go to a different shore. But um, i just show you a bit, a video um, of how the whole ISEC project works. Hope. Can we have sound to that? Is there sound to that? Yes. Visuell beeindruckend. A good experience, but I'm a bit lost by edits, different plays. <laughs> Wenn man halt zum Beispiel mit dem einen nach unten und mit dem anderen nach vorne, dann sieht man ja beides gleichzeitig. Ja. Das ist halt irgendwie, das ist irgendwie verrückt. I skip this. So, um, so you see the experience how, how, how it worked. And our idea as artists or like people doing things is to give people the chance to experience it. It's not about having a gallery piece. It's about giving it to the people and let them explore it. And with this, we go into a redefinition of what it is. So I just show you the idea of where we came from. And I think as this is the first time that we showcase it 
to, to a broader public. It will not, it, that is what we started. But now we see very many uh, or many different interpretations of what it is that, that, that we build here. So this is something that we started when we started to, point, uh, to do point of view. Because like from Isaac, we know, OK, we need to have a good um, object that includes uh, the idea of going broader. So with point of view, we wanted to have the idea of ISECT, that you can take your eyes into your hands, but wirelessly, because we wanted to have multiple helmets so that people can exchange their eyes. So if I have um, my, I take the camera eye out of my helmet that is um, including um, a VR headset and give it to another person, and exchange the eyes like this. So I have this person's eye, and he or she has my eye. So we we share that one visual sense. But to to make this attractive to people in a in a, uh, in a gallery or not in a gallery, but in a public space, we have to design the, the object very nicely so that you do not just have a VR headset, which is a bit boring. So we started with. Um, with these mood boards and with, the, with uh, first prototypes and sketches. So here you see already that, that the idea gets stronger to have very generative and um, structured surfaces to get to that kind of weird feeling, to express the weirdness in, that, you, that you feel through the surface of the, of the entire object. And um, a very boring image, but still very interesting because um, through the design process, it hasn't been sculpted as one would have done it a few years ago because everything is algorithmically designed. That means the, um, the surface is basically a blank surface in the computer program, but through different of these um, nodes and patches, a different or another a modulation comes to, to, uh, comes to the object, so it gets wavy, it gets uh, holes perforated, and then it gets a twist, and all these things intersect with each other, and if you just move one little slider here, the whole object starts to get a new shape. And that's what, it, what we wanted to do, to get a total digital workflow done so that everything is made digitally and produced with 3D printing. So as you see here, these are the first um, prototypes that came out of, the, uh, out of these nodes. And um, on, the, on the one side, you see the 3D printed tests. And on the other side, you also see the first one-to-one -one test where we try to fit in the um, VR headset. So and with this, you see in the, in the exhibition downstairs all the many different formal prototypes that we did until we said, OK, we go for the bigger one. And um, just a little excursion of what it means, and that we are not the first one to build these out-of-body ma machines or settings. This is an image um, about the. Gr oh, I'm not a Greek person and cannot speak Greek, but it's called the gray, the gray ones, and it's um, from the Greek mythology. It, it, I have another image, I guess, here. You see them, and the the gray ones um, lived in an. Uh, in a cave on an island in the, in, the, in the ancient Greek mythology. And they are like three elder women. And these three elder women share one eye and one tooth. So they, there is already that idea of a shared visual sense. And they, they've been uh, guarding a, uh, a, I don't really know, but I'm not so deep into it. But they've been guarding this kind of cave entrance. And Perseus was coming and wanted to go, get to Medusa. The, uh, because they are also Gorgons and wanted to get to, to the Medusa because of the, his whole uh, quest he was on. So um, he, he stole the eye from them and got the information on where Medusa is and didn't give the eye back. Anyway, th that's, that's the story. But still, I found it very interesting that that is nothing that has come, that, that's a 21st century thing to, to get to this idea of sharing an eye, but it is a thing that is a bit more uh, older already. And, Somehow, our first image that we did after we de finally defined all the, um, all the designs was already a bit mythological with these, um, with these floating garments um, around, the, around the people. And I don't know what else to say. Ah, yeah, this is basically, again, 
point of view, the, the, the system, how it works, so there's these guys sharing their visual perspective and cross-eyeing <laughs> together um, how it all um, goes. And a bit more um, how it looks inside. So there is, next to the idea of making an artwork, there's a lot of design, design engineering tasks related to it. So it's not mm, just a creation process coming from, yeah, let's have some fun and build things. It starts to become super, super technical and super critical. So there is uh, Jens Bayer, who was, was um, responsible for all the technological streaming, um, transmitting uh, issues. And the designer, Tom Witchell, who was for the, all the algorithmically designed tasks um, related. So he's just like words to them. And um, now I forgot what else is coming. Let's see. Ah, uh, some more info, um, images about the, uh, the variations that we made. So, the, but it's a bit redundant because they are downstairs in the, in the exhibition all visible. Anyway, um, I think I'm done with uh, what I wanted to say. Just showing a bit more uh, beautiful images. Ah, yeah. And this is how it looks when we did it. So this is the super large 3D printer that we bought for this project. And the, um, <laughs> all, the, all the helmets were around like 21 days to print. And um, yeah, so that's what, how it looks like for the um, last month in our studio. So every time there was this thing building up. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Christian. Um, our next speaker, uh, Pan Skorzen, uh, her business card reads, Theorist, Traveler, Transhumanist. I haven't got the, the business card yet, but I, I look forward to looking at it. I just, I'm super curious. Uh, she studied European art, history, philosophy, history, and English-American studies, got her MA in 1992, PhD in 1994 at the University of Heidelberg. And since 2008, she's been a professor of art studies at the Department of Design at Dortmund University of Applied Science and Arts. And since 2020, she's also vice dean. She has published numerous publications, both in German, English, and French, and Polish, uh, on the history of art and culture from the 17th to the 21st century. She lives, works, and researches in Dortmund, Milan, Los Angeles, and is on the internet under the pseudonym, pseudonym Levania Lea. So, Pam, the state is yours. Thank you, Fernanda, and uh, you now team for having me. Before I start, I would like to share some thoughts with you on art and artificial intelligence. Anyone in the room who believes that AI can be an artist? Hands up. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, okay. I think that this side is pro and the other side is contra. <laughs> okay. Uh, Christian just told us about how ma mammals see the world. Maybe they are creative too. Um, and I w would like to speculate um, whether an AI can be creative. Um, since the topic of uh, the conference is creating the future or speculating the future, I would answer the best way to predict the future is to create it. This truism, which has been on the internet, spreading as a meme across the internet for some years now, I like to quote myself whenever I'm asked to speculate about how the arts and design will further develop in these times of rapid digital transformation. Amidst the ruins and relics of modernity in the former industrial age, as we can see here at Zollverein, we endure permanent crises, global catastrophes, and pandemics in our Anthropocene. Moreover, extensive complex networks of human and non-human actors increasingly determine our existence. Carbon di dioxide 
and the coronavirus, for example, are considered to be such non-human actors and active agents nowadays, leading to severe changes in our way of living. This is closely followed by the so-called digitalization, um, a somewhat strange buzzword to all those post-digitals already experimenting with quantum computers. However, this brings us much closer to the real game change maker today, artificial intelligence. The Ars Electronica uh, this year, just a few days ago, even somebody holds a phantom is roaming around the world, visible at certain points, but mostly hidden from plain sight, moving stealthily into every era of life and work and into every private private re recess. So I want to ask, who's afraid of artificial intelligence overlords? This side. You're not, you're not afraid, <laughs> I suppose. Well, like semi-living viruses, intelligent algorithms and deep learning are changing our everyday lives and the arts and design in an unprecedented way. AI today forces people not only to understand better what awareness and intelligence are, but also to rethink creativity and art. Are creative abilities and design achievements primarily tied to a sentient biological body and human consciousness with free will? Can AI in turn have its own perception and imagination like any other sentient higher being? Philosophers are passionately arguing about this notion, where developers and coders are already working on emotional artificial intelligence. So-called effective computing promises the basis for future processing of information and data that is also experience-oriented. But rem just consider subjectivity and sensitivity are considered essential prerequisites for creating art. So I want to ask to what extent and to which purpose, purpose is AI changing the arts and design already? Since the end of the 20th century, Silicon Valley has given rise to new symbolic visions of the world, both figuratively and concretely. These visions and models are now also reflected in the contemporary arts and design, which extensively use its inventions and technologies as new tools. Artificial intelligence herein can be both technology and topic. At the same time, intelligent algorithms and powerful deep neural networks have enabled smart machines such as humanoid robots to become apparently autonomously creative in recent years. Globally, <laughs> from um, just to mention a few, from art fairs like Art Basel starting in a few days, you will see that you can buy their um, art by, uh, created by al algorithms or AI. Then we have online galleries specialized in AI art and uh, even traditional auction houses like Christie's uh, are selling AI uh, for several years. So they have developed their own, AI art has developed uh, its own characteristic overwhelming as well as mesmerizing aesthetics, perhaps best experienced, in my opinion, in Rafik Anadol's popular AI art. Next one. So here we have Rafik Anadol. Um, every revolutionary branch of research and every new technology has produced novel aesthetics and rhetorics in their times, times reflected in the arts and design, as I said before. At the same time, today we are witnessing a global aesthetic normification reinforced by standardization, conventions, and canonization through intelligent technologies, as Lev Manovich has lucidly pointed out before. 
design processes and creative decisions in architecture, communication or product design, fashion or photography, for example, are increasingly automated and supported by AI. The assistance and automation in design even now evolve to creative autonomy of intelligent algorithms and deep neural networks. So, digitalization, industry 4.0, and AI bring forth a new algorithmic aesthetic that becomes the subject and expression of itself in contemporary AI art. Digital art productions created with the help of machine learning or deep learning can thereby be understood less as autonomous works of art uh, than as respective updates of complex computer-based network te technology. Here I want to recommend to you Albert Laszlo Barabasi. He has a current exhibition at the ZKM in Karlsruhe. It's worth visiting. His study of diverse networks has provided a tremendous impetus for new network theory in this regard. It focuses on complex relationships and interdependencies of their actors and makes these visible as data visualization. So the relations are getting more and more important instead of the actors it themselves. However, AI art is always more than visible, which means what is exhibited, perceived, or collected as images, objects, installations, or scenography. Instead, AI art emerges from, from an extensive and complex network here in Bruno Latour's sense, um, established in each case by human and non-human actors interacting and acting creatively together as, and this is important, as collaboration and co-creation of humans and machines, of artists and AI. These current uh, collaborations, maybe I don't have to tell you here uh, this, to, to this audience, but these collaborations currently produce their own characteristic algorithmic form languages, for example, Ghanism or Inceptionism, Here's the work I did myself with uh, uh, this um, deep dream generator on the internet. Then, summed up under the umbrella term AI art, these algorithmic aesthetics can be understood as expressions of co creativity between man and machine. They affect their audience most of all due to their spectacular hybridity and futuristic surrealism. So, here you have again Ganism, algo art, AI. Art. Uh, I think um, the Ars Electronica used AI art, so actually coined it, and I will be launching a whole volume on AI art uh, in a couple of weeks with the Kunstform International, so this was the advertisement, so sorry, <laughs> commercial break. So, um, um, in addition to this new hierarchy free uh, co-creativity, the simultaneous establishment of a new process-oriented concept of art and design is to be emphasized, in my opinion. And uh, I want to give you an example. French artist Pierre Hugues' uh, recent mental image installations, Umwelt of Aldea and After U Umwelt, integrate AI as an autonomous image-generating component into porous ecosystems in which unpredictably dynamic interactions of biological, technical, and non-living actors evolve in the, whole, in the spirit of Latour's actor network theory. The process of their complex relationships and interdependencies can also be defined as co-creativity and co-production. At the same time, Pierre Eek, ongoing uh, mental installations can be observed as a world-building intervention that leads to a relational and complex interplay of human and non-human actors where the observers are becoming participants as well. The artist has created a kind of mega meta-algorithm for his work by releasing AI in his mental image installations from its function as a creative assistance and automation in artistic creative processes 
into a now somewhat relational uh, autonomy. In these recent uh, years, uh, in these recent installations, um, I want to stress is that the, the, the human and the artificial in imaginations are freely e exposed to biological organisms and technical entities as well as to constant uh, physical, chemical and biological processes. So um, the mental images are represented on the integrated LEDs uh, in, in, the, in this uh, room installation, space installation, um, you can visit uh, them at the moment at the LUMA, Fondation LUMA in Arles. Um, and they were generated by a direct neural interface that recorded the brain activity of a subject in a lab as they mentally imagined uh, things given to them to think about, uh, such as maybe you can decipher it, biological entities, prehistoric tools, machines, machines, codes, or work of art. The recordings were reconstructed in a research lab in Kyoto using a deep neural network that continuously employed artificial intelligence op optimization and interpretation and recognition processes to do so. so their recordings within BIEG spatial installations are influenced by all other human and non-human installation components through direct feedback loops uh, in the installation space. Here we have uh, again kind of industrial space like in the Zollverein here in Essen, which is a nice uh, parallel. And this space, new images continue to be hallucinated uh, which in turn are associated by the visitors by their individual uh, images, of course. Uh, sounds from recorded brain waves and synthetic sensors are also distributed around the room, individually triggering mental images among the re recipients. So, from all interaction and interdependencies of the involved and interconnected uh, actors, be they uh, technical, biological, or human, a transformative scenography emerges on a site or in a situation to which the recipients can ascribe meaning and relevance. In this sense, um, PLX mental image installations being created since uh, uh, 2018 are more than just compelling because they not only break the trend toward automating aesthetic decisions and global convergences of language as a form, but rather generate aesthetic diversity and initiate evolutionary processes with the use of AI. New algorithmic aesthetics can emerge from a network with unclear boundaries. They are no longer created and defined by the artist alone. Instead, Pierre conceives and initiates the specific situation, situational constellations of diverse actors for sites, uh, which subsequently influence each other and enter into unforeseeable and incalculable interactions as well as dynamic feedback loops. So, reproduction, recombination, and mutation trigger in algorithmic entities, uh, be they genetic or programmed, constant transformation and evolution. With the mental image installation, the artist creates situation-specific interventions that produce a complex ecology with creative momentum. In these, they artistically mark symbiotic life worlds that are provided, perceived as meaningful, living changing scenographics in which in turn, and this is important in, in my opinion, er everything is perceived um, uh, as uh, interconnected or everything is connected to everything else would be the slogan to this. Which leads me to James Lovelock, the wonderful man who wrote a book in his, uh, when he turned 100. So, 
this man wrote his book when he was 100 and he was released the book when he was 101. So co-creativity can be experienced herein as coexistence and co-evolution in the sense of James Lovelock. Each actor influences their environment, which is for them a surrounding world, as this in turn exerts an essential, for example, effective effect on them, resulting in a permanent change of shape and creative evolutionary pressure in a specific situation, um, which we experience in um, Pierre, Pierre X's uh, mental image installations on the whole as a meaningful immersive scenography. This dynamic interplay and the hierarchy hierarchy-free relationships and manifold interactions and entanglements of all actors result in complementary creativity that moves across the boundaries of species. According to Pierre, Pierre Higg, it, is all, it also allows for creative co-production um, of the imagination of the humans and AI. One could also uh, call it and this is maybe very hard to say, but call it the death of the genius cult in the arts. Moreover, the unpredictable and surprising interactions of entangled humans, non-humans and machines also distance us from a predominating anthropocentric view with uh, its form languages. So, in, uh, this brings me to the, almost to the end. Uh, in James Lovelock's post-Anthropocene, he calls it the Novocene, new intelligent beings will primarily emerge from existing artificial intelligent uh, systems. They will think faster than we do and be even more creative. And thus, as so-called super sapiens, they may see us as homo sapiens, views, plants and animals nowadays. However, this will not be a hostile, violent machine takeover of planet Earth as is readily imagined and staged in Hollywood science fiction blockbusters with their AI overlords. For according to James Lovelock's speculations, these hyper-intelligent and ultra-creative life forms will be as dependent on the health of the planet Earth as we humans are. They will need the planetary cooling system of Gaia to protect themselves from the increasing heat of uh, the sun, just like humans who, however, are currently changing their climate deceitfully to their disadvantage with their CO2 footprint. So according to James Lovelock, however, it is crucial that the intelligence of the Earth's ecosystem was a natural, biological, or artificial, uh, human or non-human, was its, its enormous potential for creativity survives and continues to thrive. Perhaps then the Novocene could even continue an ongoing cosmic process that will eventually lead to intelligence permeating the entire universe, or to say it was uh, called uh, theorist Carl Sagan, we are the evolving consciousness of our universe. So, like creativity, intelligence is in any case is not an abstraction, but always emerges situationally from complex system, which, for example, in Pierre Eeg's uh, recent processional xenographics can be impressively experienced as hybrid ecosystems with unstable dynamics of their own and unclear boundaries. The mental in image installations affect their audience in such a way that they gain an atmosphere of special intention and meaning, for example, as a surrounding world. Yet, you set conditions, but you cannot define the, the outcome, how a given entity will interact with another. There is a set of elements, the way they collide, confront, respond to each other, is totally unpredictable. I don't want to exhibit something to someone, but rather the reverse, says Pierre Eek, to exhibit someone to something. So, last slide. 
Nothing. Go drop back. <laughs> this is not my slide. Okay. Um, so I want to close. Um, yes, another end is possible, and I would say be creative with AI and co-evolve. At least as seen with Pierre, especially for artists and designers, artificial intelligence can be seen as a new creative field for experimenting and discovering new possibilities for creation. Even so, we are totally aware with scientist Kate Crawford that creating current AI systems depends on exploiting energy and use, using mineral resources from the planet, and it depends on cheap labor globally and big data at scale. But it is not effortless. Nevertheless, that is why I want to close this talk with a quote from Arthur I. Miller, the author of the book, The Artist in the Machine. Quote, AI is not a tool, but a sophisticated instrument that is capable of working with an artist. Collaboration happens when you both play off each other's strengths. Quote, end. To create something new, original, and innovative. However, do not forget, cooperation and collaboration also always include competition. So we don't know who will win in the future. That would be my statement. Thank you so much. <laughs>
if everything works, we can meet in the end of the talk uh, within this multiplayer platform. So everybody online as well, please, you can log in there already or uh, maybe load it already in your um, browser, Firefox. Uh, that actually, all browsers should work. And um, then if it's like doodling in the back, maybe you can either shut your, like, open a new window or then uh, shut it down, or like you can close it, but then it's already in your cache, so it's, it's taking not so long to load it later on. Okay. So, uh, yeah, just uh, put in the thingy. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, maybe one, like, my, so my background um, is in, I'm coming from performing arts, uh, theater, actually, and so uh, theater is a medium, uh, or as this medium that is often working with strong narratives, right? So I'm, I'm facing narration in general, and um, I was, since, since I'm working with this medium, I'm confronted with this question, what stories are told, by whom, on stage, be it analog or digital, and how technology is actually changing the way of how those stories are told and perceived. And um, so for me, technology, there, there were a lot of talks and panels already about the role of technology within like this uh, human, other than human uh, interactions. Um, I see technology as a tool, not just as a, in form of using devices, but as well, I think that Technology can fuel the power of imagination uh, or if, of imaginative, like different concepts on how a world uh, could look like, uh, and to build prototypes that are not based on the logics, for example, of Silicon Valley. And I try to ask how tech can be used to plant a seed for alternative realities uh, that are not yet actual and um, that are not based on the recent power dynamics. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, yeah, so except for example, what could be different relationships in building like uh, or different um, possibilities in building relationships with uh, other than human uh, agents uh, and how could this look like? So I want to start with presenting a, a performance I did 2017 in Badaos Ost as part of the artist group uh, Virtuelles Theater. Uh, that called, it's called Children of Compost and I'm almost a little shy to uh, to say that this um, performance was inspired by Donna Haraway's book, uh, Staying with the Trouble, um, the Camille stories, that's a part of the book, because I think already in talking about who is quoted, who is represented, Donna Haraway takes like a very big space. I, I think she deserves it in a way, but uh, I think there are much more theorists who are uh, doing a great job within that as well, which are not uh, for white middle class. And um, yeah, so anyways, like this Children of Compost, um, uh, so short cock, we imagine the flooded future world uh, where the only possibility of survival for humankind is to merge with um, the common Süßwasser posthorn schnecke. Uh, it's like this snail you find everywhere in aquariums or like in the canalization uh, and form a new entity. <coughs> uh, so for us as performers, uh, we try to imagine a state, like a, a pre-state or pre-merged state, where we try to let go of human physicality as much as we could and adapt to the more snaily present, uh, researching, for example, how it would feel to lose the spine uh, or how, what it means only to be able to uh, move in slime. And um, so the dramaturgy was as well a computer game. We would play on stage with different levels and these levels, uh, yet they would affect the dramaturgy and what would be done on stage and what would be researched physically. Um, yeah, maybe I just let it. So <clears throat> even if it seems obvious to, uh, to many people, but especially working with media art, I feel uh, a lot of times the body of physicality or somatic experience uh, is not emphasized enough and what this actually means and that uh, the, like the way we are within our body, not just how our body is perceived, but uh, effects on how we, or we, like, interact with um, uh, our surroundings as individuals and, as, of course, um, as society. Um, so, <clears throat> out of Children of Compass, there were many questions for me that arose out of this work. Um, one was how to deal with co-option co uh, and commodification of um, any kind of social movements um, or actions by capitalism. Uh, and another one, and this is where I will um, uh, talk about more now, it, what, what does it mean to actually care? Because in Children of Compass, it's as well like to take care of a species that is so uh, um, 
alien to you or like so far away from you. Uh, and I was questioning like how, how much theory is behind that and how much I could actually really like implement the thought in my own being. And what state do I actually have to be in to really care about a snail? Uh, and yeah, to be more careful about my surrounding and as well about my own uh, physicality or my own um, health. Um, and as well, I questioned the way of how stories or how I tend to like, especially like in theater, how, how we tend to force stories on other agents. Um, be it human or other than human, due to a lack of uh, con um, communication in any sense. And I kind of got tired of the stories and the reusing of the stories, so I was looking for a more objective way of how to uh, do art and work together with these agents. And um, so I started, <coughs> uh, I started to get into <laughs> uh, digital art myself, like um, working with sensors. And um, so my first approach <laughs> was this nature communication glove. And it was like this uh, uh, digital device, like a wearable, which would collect um, data from your environment, like um, uh, CO2 data or the moist of the earth. Uh, and then, um, so fetch this data and then transform it into image the images that are changed and then there also were like band sensors, so if the image has changed, the body or the person who is wearing this device would um, move, like uh, depending on the image, and then you have like this kind of feedback loop. So I tried, of course I know as well that technology is never neutral, even if you work with sensors, it depends on the build up, it depends on the sensor, but uh, for me it was at least not this uh, uh, huge narration I had to put on this work. And um, <clears throat> so, yeah, so this form of and I stayed with this form of interaction and the thought of like establishing these feedback systems. And um, yeah, so the, and then when I was like, so I, there were like several prototypes afterwards and um, then Corona actually hit and, uh, and changed the, to the situation like so for a performing artist um, um, totally. And um, so, now I will like present the work I'm working like I'm working right on right now. It's um, it, and we will that's as well the multiplayer connected to it, uh, which we hopefully will experience all together. So, um, but with this new situation coming up, like Corona. Um, oh, sorry, I've been. Yeah. Uh, there was a question, of course, okay, what, what, what is like, how do you deal with the audience? Like, how could you actually uh, create a delocalized de collective experience, still emphasizing on physical awareness of uh, the bodies of the spectator? Um, as well, again, like to the matter of care, which was strongly emphasized in the corona pandemic on uh, uh, very different levels, like care work, but as well, um, for me, what it means to actually, yeah, take care. Uh, so in the structural matter, but also as a personal and communal sense, how can we take care of one another, of our surrounding, of ourselves, and what does it take to be able to enter a state of caretaking overall? Uh, and what state do I actually have to be in to, to care? Um, <clears throat> then also, of course, like everybody was one and a half years uh, sitting a lot in front of their computers, neglecting uh, somatic needs like movement or touch, um, at least that's what I uh, got feedback from my uh, surrounding. And, um, and then like, situa like living situations changed even more precarious, our lives became more precarious or like the future fear got bigger for most of us. Um, and the work I'm, work yeah, what I'm working on right now is like called uh, Leaking Bodies, Perus Mind and Melting Machines, that's the working title. And I'm working on this uh, together with Anton Krause and Olga Hohmann which unfortunately can't be here, but Anton will with us in the multiplayer, hopefully. And um, <clears throat> so this work, sorry, uh, questions, what are the effects like this, the, like, oh, sorry. Yeah, so living in this uh, precarious neoliberal society, what are the effects that this has on our body? And uh, what are the effects of living in that, that system? and how do they show on our bodies. Um, <clears throat> and also, oh sorry, this is like... Uh, 
So I, I have to, uh, sorry, I have to skip that for, I, I'm just sticking to it. Okay, so, um, so leaking bodies is, uh, again, it's like, uh, we build it a multiplayer platform, like going back to the thought, like how, how can audience participate if they're not locally in the same space, and as well, how can you have a shared experience? Uh, we're building on this multiplayer platform right now. And, um, and in the, on spot, like in the installation, we collect, connect it with uh, sensors, like we are using a breathing sensor, for example, which fetches the breathing data of the person who is in the multi, like who's playing the multiplayer, but it, being in the installation and the data is due with um, MQTT protocol sent into that multiplayer. And then there is this feedback system that you can, um, with the same protocols, uh, steer actuators, which is, could be pretty much everything that is an uh, elect like electrical device. And um, <coughs> so I'm building right now this uh, inflatable suit, uh, um, which, which I'll show you now. So which that's all like prototypes, so which inflates when, you, when you're breathing. So you have this feedback system that puts pressure back into your body. And even if you have like this uh, mediatized experience, that you still have like the awareness of what your body, like where your body is. Uh, as well, because the installation deals with normativity of bodies, and there is like this, um, and how in a hypervisualized culture, we, bodies are shown to us and um, set as normal, set as a default state. And um, so by inflating your body while breathing, uh, it kind of uh, uh, um, changes as well the, the, our own physicality or the physicality of the person who's uh, wearing it. And um, uh, yeah, so uh, here we have that again. So maybe back to leaking body. <laughs> so the multiplayer, um, as I already said, I've been questioning what state I have to be in to, t to be careful towards my environment. And I experienced that as long as I deal with my own, um, uh, or like as, as long as I'm not, for example, healthy, as long as I don't, uh, um, am not taking care, as, I, as long as I don't take care enough with my own uh, well-being, I'm not able to actually truly uh, involve into like a, a caring situation. <laughs> and uh, so I was figuring, like, I tried to pinpoint on um, this, this neoliberal inscriptions that are already had happened in, in my body that, that, that are signs of this not caretaking enough. And um, even if it's like a personal approach, I, it's all um, inscriptions that I would say that are not just um, a matter of my own health, but that I feel that, I, that, that it's a social... Um, that, that people can relate because it's not just, yeah, not just my body uh, affected by it. For example, like teeth grinding um, or like uh, uh, skin rashes, like all like little things that still make you function within the neoliberal sense, but, you, uh, but are already signs of exhaustion. And uh, so these signs of exhaust, exhaustion serve as uh, the, the ground structure of the levels uh, like for example here, it's called the grinder, one level that is about like this, this overall tension we have as, as when you are like have this bruxism that you grind your body away at night. Um, and, um, and this personal approach is get, uh, so we're trying to make this into a bigger like a um, discourse. Uh, within that level. It's a multi, like it's an open world game, so we more like l walk around and experience uh, uh, these levels and collect knowledge if you want so. And um, yeah, or like the level the Vitruvian, which uh, um, uh, where we're researching on where, when did, when did it start that bodies got to be um, quantified. And um, so, like in the Renaissance, in the Vitruvian male, still as the stereotype on all our health insurance cards of the perfectly healthy, perfect body, which is like this middle-aged white man, and uh, it's still overrepresented everywhere. And um, <clears throat> so. Yeah, that's maybe already it. And uh, maybe we can meet now in the multiplayer platform. Um, if anybody's there, and I will show, and you can experience this platform with me. And then um, if you can pull the sound on, that would be cool. What, how much time do we have left? Sorry, I didn't look. No. Okay, perfect. 
Okay, so everybody who is at home can uh, log in, and I hope it will work. JK. Oh, no, we do it Alaska. Is the sound on? It's not, no? Hello? It should play mu uh, something. Yeah. Sound? To notice what you are touching should, can, we, moment. can we raise it up? What are you interacting with? So now we let your fingers slide the over the keyboard. But move your cursor with your fingers on your trackpad or on your mouse. Let your cursor move in little circles in the middle of your screen. It's some kind of meditation. We could all do it. Now we have to jump into it. Now, let your nose follow along with every movement. With every circle, the movement can get a little bigger and bigger and bigger until you reach the edges of your screen. You don't see what that. is it? 11.6 inches? 70? Or even 21? External screen? What's the size of your device? I heard people saying they want to be moved by art. I don't want you to be moved, but I want you to move. Move your hand. Try to put it on the part of the body that hurts you the most. Then, put it on the part of your body that hurts the least. Put it on the part of your body that you like the best. And now, on the part that you dislike the most. I've heard people rave about being emotionally triggered by art. I don't need you to get emotional, but I need you to breathe. Close your eyes. Imagine a situation that brought you comfort. Maybe being touched or held by a person you feel physically safe with. A moment of stillness and peace. Deepen your breath. Focus on your breathing. Inhale this moment. Breathe in. Hold your breath. Breathe out. Breathe in. Hold your breath. Breathe out. Breathe in. Hold your breath. Breathe out. Okay. So now we just, nobody's here in the multiplayer, unfortunately. We had to do what this, this uh, to as well to leave the to water. And now you can just like discover like different levels. For example, uh, like working in this, walking, discovering this space. And I see where the Vitruvian is, because I want to go with you into the Vitruvian area. A state of confidence or a state of insecurity? A state of longing? Yeah, and it's sad or because, uh, yeah, usually, I mean, you would have this experience together, so you can as well, ah, um, let it just show you. So there are ways of interaction, <laughs> of, like physically interacting with your avatar. Uh, through the mousepad one, two, and three, for, and you can as well talk with one another. A state where borders are felt. Ah, there's somebody. Or a cool. 
wherever it is. <laughs> okay, How so the body maybe the person is the following. Body that thinks of the body. Ah, you can run on uh, shift for anybody who is there in the space. Okay, just like we just go into that level and then I'm done because then everybody else can as well. Um, doesn't. Okay, that doesn't work anyway. So it's like a work, work in progress, <laughs> totally. Um, we sp this multiplayer will grow. And um, as well, I see it more as a um, as the some body exists ah. in the space. Oh, wow, amazing! It constitutes the uh, space. As some kind of archive uh, for like all the findings and the research we are doing. Because I'm like thinking about archiving anyways. Like, how do you share your research? As well, like how the build up I was just showing. We tried to put it online as well on one uh, uh, homepage, which is not. Like, which is really messy, so that's why I didn't put the address up. But if you want to uh, know more about the feedback with this uh, feedback system uh, setup, I can. I'm happily sharing that with you. And um, yeah, so uh, sorry. Yeah, okay, time. And uh, maybe just like one last thing, because uh, it's for me it's important as well to say that there are lots of people I, I want to <laughs> actually thank because. They like, kind of brought me, like Friedrich Kirchner and Hannah Perna Wilson, because they were the ones who introduced me to the sensors and the multiplayer. So I feel it's always important as well to, to say whom, whom you get inspired by. And um, yeah, so I guess for now that's it. And uh, thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you, Jana. Maybe Sorry. stay here because yeah. now we, we have our discussion. I was just going to say, like, we, I don't think anybody meant to let you alone at the multiplayer. I, <laughs> I, was, no, trying no, to, I was trying to log in, but I couldn't load. And I was thinking, maybe we can make an appointment yeah, and yeah, invite everyone <laughs> to meet maybe tonight, I don't know, and try to post at the new now um, social media channels so we can all meet at the multiplayer yeah, and, nice. and test it and try it out. That would be really nice. So I would love to invite back Kristen and Pam so we can finally... Uh, sit here and, and have our discussion. I think we Anyone? still need one more chair. <laughs> and then we are set. <laughs> Sorry, I hope I didn't talk too long. Okay. No. Here we go. Sure. Sorry. It's very cozy. <laughs> Okay, so first of all, thank you uh, very much uh, for your inputs. Um, and I'm super, super glad that you know, we still have some time to, to discuss. Um, I mean, there's so much, uh, there's all you know, the topics about, I really like that Pam brought up the um, James Lovelock and the whole Gaia theory and you know, like, uh, that we are all connected and not only, I haven't read Neocene yet, but um, I'm kind of super excited about it. And I think this is definitely like one point that perhaps we could take as a starting point that, you know, like taking the Gaia theory as this idea that we live in this complex, interconnected, self-regulating environment that includes all beings, uh, not only, um, you know, biological beings, but now also that he's bringing this idea that artificial, um, you know, uh, intelligence and everything we create is also kind of depending on the functioning of Gaia on this system. How do you see this idea, like Lovelock's idea, maybe you can start, Pam, because you, you kind of mentioned him, uh, moving forward with this idea of another end is possible? Uh, how do you see, uh, you know, non, uh, like more than human um, beings or narratives kind of playing out uh, within this context? Maybe uh, James Lovelock is a kind of provocation to some modern artists because he uh, propagates this uh, hierarchy free uh, co creativity. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, accepting that there is creativity all over the world. And uh, even as an artist, I feel as you think that you are uh, um, so creating something from 
say, from your inner side, from your own subjectivity, that might be true, but it's always uh, in connection with the world you're living in and uh, those cohibitants, also those co-living uh, entities that have an influence. And so um, I found it quite fascinating that he uh, thinks that, uh, and you can illustrate it, uh, with some um, uh, contemporary installation art that um, you have technical components, biological components, and then the human part, and everything uh, is interconnected, has interdependencies, and um, uh, altogether it's a kind of co-production, a co-creativity that has an element of evolution in it and a constant transformation. So maybe humankind has to become more humble again and accept there's a kind of holistic creativity we can work with and we can connect with it and uh, think in the sense of a Gaia, of a global planet and that has its own intelligence that will involve and we are only a kind of step in the evolution like Homo sapiens will uh, as uh, James Lovelock says, um, Homo sapiens looks at plants and uh, the animals, maybe the um, evolving, upcoming super sapiens will look at us uh, humans later on, like uh, we do nowadays to uh, look at plants and, and, and animals. So I found it quite uh, interesting to see here both artists uh, uh, having this idea of the interconnectedness and especially Christian's uh, idea uh, how mm, other um, animals perceive the world and uh, construct the world in a way. Yeah, I was going to say that, Christian, because mm -hmm. also you, you, you bring this idea of not only how to experience what you know other species experience, how they experience the world, but also how our environment and spaces kind of reflect the way we kind of uh, have those perceptions and how we can kind of uh, manipulate also uh, this, this, uh, these feelings. And um, do you have anything to kind of complement on the thought of the interconnectedness of Gaia and all beings? <laughs> uh, yes, because I don't know James Lovelock yet. Okay. So uh, just when Who you've been him? talking about it, uh, I just had on Wikipedia, uh, what's this? <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. No, but what I, what I like about the idea of um, interconnectedness is um, that, it, that it needs a competence and empathy. So you, you have to get the um, expertise in f to, to feel yourself into other subjects. So it's, um, and that is something that, um, that, I, that I find very interesting and that is that um, that when it comes to, to, to subjects, you, that you have to include technological subjects as well, like, for example, the entity of AI, for example. So that is, that is, that is super interesting, but it, it reaches a complexity on, on which it, it, I would say, as a regular artist or technological creative, it gets super, super, super complex, so that you could really leave paths and get lost in so many options. So I'm, I'm, ve I'm, I'm very much in, not into to lowering complexity at all, but to, to be um, handlungsfähig, like to, to stay um, active, to, to, to reach something, to, to, be, to gain output or outcome. It's good to, to focus on one thing, and on a linear stretch, combining them to see what this might lead to, because that is also something that you have the, the time and space, like the now, but it's still in a linearity of, um, of events happening. So it's good to stick to one after the other. Yeah, I think it's really interesting that you bring the um, topic of empathy because basically that's you know also what you're doing with your work and uh, like when you're presenting it also made me think of other works, uh, for example, uh, in the Eye of the Animal by Marshmallow Laser Feast that you kind of see the world through the eyes and I think in their case it's just insects but you know and you're working with like the idea of you came from mammals but it's, it's the same kind of concept and um, and I think like in this works again like we have to bring back the body 
body, right? To have, it's this idea of putting yourself in the shoes of this other species, and there is a lot to do with our senses, reconnecting with presence and the body. And then it brings me, like, <laughs> makes me think of your work, uh, Janer, because you, you were playing with, with this a lot, like trying to bring back the body into the, into the equation. And uh, I really loved the, when you're talking about the performance and like how to, you know, I, tell, I was thinking, oh, be slime, my friend. <laughs> you know? Like to how to connect um, with a, a, another being that feels maybe so distant and also that we often, you know, don't even would pay attention. And how do you relate to that with a different body, different movement, a different type of existence? And maybe you can talk a little bit about this. Yeah. I I want to say one thing uh, in advance because uh, maybe that is, um, how do you say, like contrapointing my own uh, work at, at, uh, uh, somehow, but I'm thinking as well a lot about the term empathy, and somehow I find empathy as well like a, a construct of power, no? Like, I mean, do I, that was actually after Children of Compost for me really like this. I'm just like, I don't know how a snail feels. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. I just can say like, aha, a human body can't, it's not so good for me to have slime. Mm -hmm. And what like, so it's just like more, I, I think I experienced uh, more about my own body, but not about being a snail. Mm -hmm. And I, so I'm, yeah, and I'm questioning if empathy is always this, oh, I have to understand the other to actually be empathic. Like, no, it's just like, except there is another being that is not you and that is far away from you and still, like, not, don't be an asshole towards that being. Or, like, as well, like, I mean, you can do that. So, I'm, yeah, that's, but it's a thought I have a lot. Or I'm, I'm like, um, that it's rotating in my head. And um, as well with the Gaia theory, I mean, I've, and I found it important to as well uh, mention Lynn, Lynn Margulis. It's like, so it's Lovelock mm -hmm. and Lynn Margulis, yeah, yeah. and um, they are, they developed this theory then together. And, um, and I find as well, like, I really like her, her idea of that, this, that, so the planet is an autopoietic system and the planet doesn't care if we are there or not, we humans. Mm -hmm. So even if there is not a meta-human, maybe there are just like non-carbon-based mm -hmm. creatures and we just can't deal with that fact that it's not going to be anything we relate to mm -hmm. because it's like maybe bacteria and algae still, uh, still alive form and uh, that's how the planet regulates. So now just this life can exist in the regulations of, of, of this autopoietic system, which I found interesting as well, like how much can we actually do and how, how uh, egoistic is it in that sense as well to try to always like maintain your the, the own like the life of the species, but yeah, so, but, um, and then, <laughs> sorry, now I just answered a totally different question that wasn't no, raised by it. you, but if I found it important, and yeah. No, but I think it's a very good point, but I think in the end of the day, like, empathy is also about, it can be, I know what you're saying, like, this it can be a bit of, a, like, an arrogant position, but, but on the other hand, it's also about um, respect, and then you're saying, like, oh, acceptance, you know, that something is different, other than me, but we coexist and we have our roles and, you know, and respect that kind of this realm. But uh, I know it's, um, I think uh, it, it's, a, it's a struggle, you know, but I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of artists also working in this field and using new technologies to try to get us maybe closer or connect. And this is something that I would like to ask. It made also, your work made me think a lot of uh, artists like Moon Ribas. Oh, you yeah. probably know her. Yeah. Um, she's a choreographer and she had like a, a sensor, add, an added sense to her body that she would sense the movement of the tectonic plates uh, of the planet and then she would dance or create her choreographies inspired by this extra sense that she had in her body. Uh, I think she removed it right now, but I find it yeah. really interesting because for her, it was also like a way of connecting to the planet or, you know, creating this synergy. And um, so, again, it's almost like technology facilitating a connection that seems very far from technology, you know, like in, at a first sight. So, how would you see that? I know your work is close somehow to, to the... No, I mean, I, I love, like, I, love, I really like her, the way of how she approaches the, uh, her work and what you were just saying with, like, as well, sensing this earthquake or the moving, but, uh, on, and then reacting on it. And... Um, yeah, but I mean, I think as well, it's like a two-sided blade, because I feel like if I work a lot, 
Um, like just now, before this presentation, I, we've been finishing this multiplayer, and even if I talk about bringing the body in, I spend a lot of time in front of my screen and my keyboard, and it always like it, it's so absurd to me because in the phases where I perform more, I'm actually using my body. I'm so much more aware of my surrounding because I I have senses I can use first of all, and I don't even really use them, and then. I need technology to enhance the different, which is like, you know, like it's not the one or the other, but it's just like something to, um, I'm constantly like struggling with as well. And um, yeah, but I mean, I think especially in the, in the senses that I just don't have as a human being and to use technology to, to as, as a form of communication tool or a recognition tool, um, yeah, that's, so I can't even say, I'm, I, I want to continue to work with sensors, that's for sure, yeah. Christian, what do you think of this um, kind of technology as a bridge to connect us to, to other species? Do you think it's, a, I mean, of course, you're using this in your work, but do you think this is something moving forward that, I mean, in art, we see that a lot, but that as a society, we will accept this and embrace it? That's what... I don't know. I, I was thinking about um, about the about what you said about empathy and about understanding, because um, in my eyes the um, empathy is a bit different from understanding things. Because, like when you do the the slime performance, you do not understand or you cannot understand, as you say, how, how a snail feels or what. It, it's a different. It's a whole different thing. But um, if you can get a feeling of being slimy, and this is something that, that gives you feedback to, to your no normal um, life as a hum human entity. So it, it can give you a feeling. And I think that, that is something that where you gain understanding, but it's not in an abstract in an abstract way of understanding how to be. And I think there is um, also coming to the question of how to can, can technology enhance this empathy to a certain point. There, because it's uh, also, as you say, that there is this moment, OK, I have to code this empathy. It's like already like, oh, fuck. You sit in front of the screen 24-7 to make something that feels a bit. But until then, you get back pains and <laughs> headaches. <laughs> and, crash your family because you do not have time anymore. So these are things that, that, that are a bit like controversial in the process. And getting yeah. the process back is yeah, it's, it's different, difficult, I would say. But you refer to feelings and you're talking about empathy. What is interesting to me, or my question would be, would you attribute a um, kind of consciousness to a snake or to a mammal uh, or to an um, AI system? Let's talk about awareness and, uh, and consciousness as a kind of prerequisite for creativity. Would you say? It's not, not only a biological reaction that we can perceive and can kind of uh, have a notion for it and feel like, like a mammal in this way. Would you say they also have a kind of consciousness like humans? Um, no. Um, because I that, <laughs> because that's, that's interesting, but for, for me, we, we have as this, this idea in philosophy that you need uh, consciousness and will to be creative or to be an artist, mm -hmm. kind of subjectivity. And uh, if we uh, now uh, consider that every living being and even non-living beings or semi-living li like virus, for example, was changing our way of living. So we have this interconnectedness here and it's kind of creative in a way. Um, we ha have still have this question, uh, what does it need to be uh, to ascribe creativity to an entity or to a living thing? So that was my question while um, experiencing your wonderful performance and uh, your your equipment uh, that uh, gives me the chance to uh, perceive the world in a, from a total different perspective, different worldview. But this um, jump, this skip 
of um, perceiving the world, does that mean also um, uh, th that gives me a different kind of state of creativity while interacting with the world? That would be my question that I find quite fascinating because we asked, this was my question, can AI be an, an artist? If you look at uh, the art market at the moment, the art market says yes. Uh, and you would say no, they, 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 are, they don't have a consciousness, so. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that goes a little bit back, maybe is it okay? <laughs> <Sorry>. yeah, sure, <laughs> yeah. But uh, um, when you were just saying with this, um, with empathy and caretaking and like what do you, and then you're referring to the slime thing, because I was like, oh, it's not good for my body. It's not true, actually. It was just made my body move differently. So I would say, maybe I'm not even empathic, but I'm inspired by it. And that's as well, you know, like if you, you take a system, like you try to, to uh, simulate uh, a, a, a certain behavior or like a like, how, how do you say, like a physicality of, an, of a certain animal, animal and you're not going to become that animal but because you have a different um, mediatized experience mm -hmm. you will experience your body in a different way maybe and then yeah. you have a new sensation where you can grow or yeah like but yeah, because it's a perception loop you, you create you, you as an artist create a feedback that gives you back a certain impression, feeling, situa situativeness, in a way. So this is something that that you that you create and that gives you. Now, yeah, like I would say, empathy of how it might be to be a snail. Ah, okay. Hmm. Well, I might not step on the snail next time because I know it's hard to be a snail because snailing around is not so easy. Though there is your know, your first step where you come from might not be right because you cannot understand it. It's, 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 a, it's a totally different um, category of being. Still, you are in the same world and this difference is not, a, is not relevant in a way if you, if you follow Haraway and all these um, ideas of how to live in a symbiosis with, with others. So that is, um, that is true. And, re and coming to your idea of, of the whole AI system, and if there is a consciousness or not, um, I would not. And maybe it, maybe it's also something about the images you use to um, to illustrate the idea of of, of AI. You had these uh, uh, this like like, like blue stock photoish uh, AI images of yeah, there is the the robot and there's the hand that and and all that blue matrix um, number columns. Um, this is. Um, the, that's not how AI is. This is something that we it's interpret in interpretate inter like it's a mess. Uh, yeah. that we put in there. And by this, by by using these images ourselves, we think, ah, okay, there is a humanoid aspect, so might be also like a consciousness involved. Totally agree with mm. you. Yeah, totally. and so that's why. I think this is a bit uh, hard to discuss. If they also, uh, I'm not super deep into what is consciousness, but there are these these funny birds that uh, I think in Australia they for in their mating behavior they decorate their their nests in a beautiful way, and um, then they have their there's a pile of red berries, there is blue trash, and all that stuff. They are not creative or artists in a way, but they create visual input that might get them into a feeling that is, might be interesting for mating partners. So but again, I guess then we are defining what is creative, what is not creative, right? Yeah. It's coming from like what is consciousness or, you know, so there is like it's a then anthropocentric kind of point of view of how we define consciousness and creativity. So I think this is also as something we should consider, and and coming back to the um, to the snail, it's like again, it's like a step further, maybe into feeling not so alien in relation to this other being. Maybe you never be able to experience this existence, but you feel a little bit closer to what this existence could be like, you know. And this is maybe something that can help us to to kind of live in this uh, multi-species uh, vision <laughs> of, of the future, living in, in, um, in, in kind of harmony. I would like to just quickly check if anybody in the audience has questions. 
If you do, there is a mic, uh, you can see at the back, you can walk up to it and just, um, I forgot to tell you that, you can just walk up to it and ask questions directly to us. So if you do, please just walk there and if I see somebody standing, uh, we will um, turn the attention to you. So yeah, of course, like Haraway came out, come up a lot when you're talking about um, these topics and made me think of the, I mean, all the, the, the manifests, you know, the manifesto of the companion species. And what I really like is that in the title, um, the companion species manifesto says dogs, people, and significant otherness. And I really like this, how she uses significant otherness because we use that a lot among people, right? And I was just wondering, like, what in your vision could be the significant otherness of this other end that is possible for us, considering that, you know, we have artificial intelligence, we were talking a lot about collaboration, you know, uh, with AI, like artists collaboration with AI, there is still a question of like, is there AI art or not, it's a huge question. What could this significant otherness be like in our personal lives, in our work lives, uh, mainly, uh, when we basically, Extend, we already have this extension of our bodies, right? You're saying like, I need, I'm in front of my screen, I need my laptop to create so much, and even though you, you're not still, you're not a cyborg yet, <laughs> but we already, <laughs> we, 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 can we kind argue of, that thing. We could like, say that we already are, right? It's just like a, an external kind of uh, extensions of our bodies, and, and there is a certain dependency also. So what this uh, significant otherness would look like in this other new, this new now and uh, new possible end. And uh, just to, the, so the status quo end is, we, everything's gonna go down the drain. Uh, I don't know, is this, how you, there see, is, is this how you see it? No, but <laughs> I'm just like, a question because if you say another end is possible, or somehow implicates that there is like a vision, like one stated vision of yeah. one end. No, so I was it, yeah, well, it's this idea that like there is not one one way and also yeah. that an end can be a new beginning. And and I think that's kind of the, 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 the idea of the conference that you now we always taking this apocalyptic approach to, you know, our um, our technological developments and how we how which direction society is going, that there are other things and perhaps what seems apocalyptic to us or has been interpreted as such could also represent a new beginning or a new way of looking at things. So yeah. I would be rather optimistic we will co evolve. Uh, I would like to ask you, would you like to travel without your smartphone? Yeah. Mm, that's do you travel without your smartphones? Most people would say no, so we will, conver uh, we will be connected with technology and our biologically, biology will transform. So co-evolution, co-creativity will lead to a different kind of world, but the, the world won't uh, get... Uh, um, won't disappear. It will be a totally different world, but uh, it, will, it will be a kind of evolutionary process. So I would be rather uh, optimistic than pessimistic. And mm -hmm. I, I feel that nowadays most people are more the ap apocalyptics. <laughs> and I would say, uh, okay, Homo sapiens was just a step in the evolution, and there will be maybe a super sapiens, and uh, we should try to co-evolve. Co so but like I, most people would say, I don't exist without my smartphone, mm -hmm. without my digital double, my digital twin. So I found your, your work fascinating because that's kind of, to me, kind of illustration how we transform and co-evolve. Maybe you could say you don't like it, but most people found it fa find it quite fascinating, would say. It doesn't yes. have to be negative. So and that's just, the, I think yeah. it's just much easier to foresee mm. an apocalyptic view or mm. a, a, a dystopia than to think about mm. uh, something in between. You know, like visualizing a dystopia or a utopia is kind of easier than trying to find something in the middle yeah. that is a middle. lot more complex, right? Yeah. So yeah. I think this is, and I really love what you said, Jana, about technology kind of stimulating our imaginations. And I think we've been, you know, inspired like in culture, literature, film, by technological developments has really kind of fueled human imagination. 
And I think this also, perhaps technology also plays a role there to kind of make us imagine this more complex and not so obvious dystopias or utopias of the future and how we're going to live um, within this landscape. But it's interesting at the moment we humans are curious about the imaginations of other co-living entities. Yeah? So I would be curious how a mammal uh, not only perceives the world, but what kind of model of the world or what kind of imagination uh, does these entities have? On be they uh, programmed or genetic entities. So I think this is quite fascinating. And most artists are working with this idea to accepting there's more than our imagination, our con construction of the worlds. And you could call it empathy. I, I'm, I'm more constru constructivistic in this way. And uh, I think this is our cur curiousness at the moment, and you can work as an artist with it. And we have these wonderful examples, and in, in this uh, um, in this new now exhibition, which I would title as kind of digital romantic. So you have the dystopia yeah, and yeah. the utopia combined. It's quite ambivalent. But from the outside, as a critic, as a serious, I find it quite fascinating. I do try to sum it up again, and this curiousness that's as we humans are at the moment quite curious that we suddenly realize maybe there are other coexisting living entities, actors, agents, and we uh, take CO2, uh, carbon dioxide is changing the world at the moment, or uh, the coronavirus, or we humans. So uh, there are multiplayer, it's a multiplayer world. And in the, mod in the modern time, in modernity, we thought we are the masters of this world, the master of the universe. We are no such thing. I just um, have the thought about it. what I already found interesting that the fest, like the whole festival is called New Now, and then this conference is called Another End is Possible, which is already like a different time uh, uh, perception. So like a New Now, I think it's totally like the present, and I feel this is super important. Uh, again, quoting Herbert as well, Anna Löwenhaut Singh, you know, saying, okay, <laughs> it's about living on ruins, first of all, like as well staying with the trouble, not, ne like not neglecting that there is so much already wrong. Mm -hmm. And uh, so many, like, and we won't be able, to, it's not about fixing, it's about like taking what's there and then maybe changing like now and like ha not having like this big, always like future wi vision and neglecting what, yeah. What you, so acting I, now. Yeah, so. Acting now. Acting now, yeah. Acting now. A be creative. Or being now, or I don't, which comes again as well back, I feel, always to the physical of like being and like actually sensing where, where you are, like what, how does your body feel, how do you feel, and not like being always in but somewhere else. But, but I mm -hmm. actually would add, uh, when you say act now, that would me mean to me be co-creative. Not to think I don't that you I don't even think that it always necessary has to, has to take, like that you always have to take action. Like being creative, I find really difficult if uh, if I see this as a parameter of how I should live my life. Maybe just don't be anything. That first of all, like you know, that could be. Yeah, yeah, to, yeah, to add this, like I, I was thinking, yeah, don't be an asshole. I think <laughs> that is basically the, the 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 baseline of everything. Like as, like all these, like I think about the process. It's always a continuum. Like these, as you say, like this. Talking about ends in a festival that is new now is, is really tricky because, but I don't want to imagine an end because I don't see this as a, as a monolined way to go. It's something that is loopy, that is helixy, that is somehow mobiusy. Like it's mm -hmm. all going through each other and it's all entangled. And um, within this, it comes back, this is like, but maybe if you go back, be a bit like myth mythologically or a bit like ESO, it's always coming back. And it's something, okay, if you're not an asshole, basically you, you, that's the first step. And from that, coming from that, it's easy to be fair to animals, it's, it's easier to be fair to others, to be fair with, to a future, because this is something, if you, if, if you take the future not as something that will happen, but that is, can be designed in a positive, designed in a positive way. It, it's a it's a it's a mind question of mindset 
I would say, and just to be fair and not evil. Oh. So for, just, like, for me, it would be translated not being an asshole, like being, how do, you get, how do I get myself into a state of care? And yeah. I, mean, I no, really so mean no. that, is, that, that within, yeah. like, for myself or like, so. Yeah. And not of fear, sorry, because I feel like we are so, like, that's, I don't know, that's going to go in another. No, on this note, I think we are running out of time, but I think this is really like, I think the message, right? Like that we are, uh, we get into, I really like how we describe it, the a state of care and in the now, in the here, because also I think we tend a lot to look into the future and maybe this future doesn't belong to us, you know? It's not, it's not, uh, of course you have to think about what are the, how, wh how do you crystallize the future with the actions that we do today and about like caring and having this awareness, I guess, of like, living in this multiplayer in real life and digital environments, right, um, that we, we kind of co-inhabit, how do we um, just live in, har in a better kind of harmony and try to, to relate and connect to one another, biological, non-biological, uh, all species involved, and we understand better our interdependencies and, and interconnections and relationships, where you're talking about also this work, it's all about relationships and not much, so much about the agents anymore. So on that note, I would like to thank you very, very, very much, and um, hopefully see you soon again. Thank you, thank Fernanda. You. <laughs>